Welcome back to the Lutheran History Podcast. This is the second episode where we look at and analyze the Frank Kaler letter collection. Last time we talked about the background of this primary source collection and its great value for understanding this mid-19th century transitional phase of, of Lutheran immigration. We asked the question, what caused the Frank Kaler's by and large, to join the Wisconsin Synod, at least those who lived in Wisconsin. It's a rather interesting question because I think it looks at this period of church history from a perspective that is not often analyzed, and it's not really possible to analyze it, but that's what makes this wealth of information so valuable. Last episode, we talked more about the historiography, how this collection had been collected, assembled, and how a few people, a few historians had looked at it and maybe gleaned some other aspects out of it. But shockingly, uh, even the church historians, the few that did look at this, did not really fully analyze um, or incorporate this material into the story of the history we're looking at in the Wisconsin Synod or the broader context at large. So last time we talked a bit about the context of, of immigration founding synods and really how these immigrant families came across a totally foreign religious landscape when they came to America. It wasn't just that they had moved geographically to a whole new country, a whole new land, a whole new culture. A lot of the familiar things about religion as they had experienced was totally different. So we see a lot of the challenges in the last episode and how they made that transition. We're going to continue to see that. We talked about the issues of Lutheran identity as well, how they distinguished themselves from other Lutherans or how they uh, try to define their own Lutheran beliefs. We'll look more at some of those aspects in today's episode as well. So hopefully that served as a quick review for what we talked about last time or encouragement to listen to the previous episode if you have not done so already. But now we'll quickly get back into the main subject matter of what can we get out of this letter collection. So as we, as I analyzed uh, the Frank Kaler letters over the last couple of years, I found that there is a theme of filling religious needs. And this is selecting uh, a pastor and usually with the pastor, uh, the pastor's synod. Uh, it wasn't so much that synods had such a large identity at this point, perhaps other than maybe a negative identity. We talked about that old Lutheran identity was not a very positive one for the Frank Carolers, and whether that was coming from more of a Missouri synod or a, a Grabau synod, or I should say Buffalo synod perspective, um, they're still trying to maybe avoid that just from their reputation or their personal experiences with it, but otherwise they're still looking for a Lutheran synod, and we'll talk about how that plays out. So we have an example of Matilda Kuhne to Veronica and Regina Kerler, a letter in 1850, so really the first or second year of being here in America. This is what Matilda noted. She said, quote, Delightful activity has sprung up among the farmers recently concerning church and school. A roomy schoolhouse was built last summer, and a teacher was called for three months. The past three months were at a standstill, but with the new year, the school will begin again under the leadership of a German woman. However, only English will be used for the time being. Church services are being held in the schoolhouse every third Sunday. And do you know by whom? A Swabian, an Omer, so a man from Ulm, who was hired as city pastor for half a year. His first two deliveries here in the woods met with approval. Say what you will, Swabia is the nicest land, and the Swabians are the most good-natured folk one can find. Yesterday, the minister spent the afternoon with us, end quote. So there are a lot of things we can uh, pick out from that letter. Um, for me, it hit close to home, obviously, being already a Wisconsin Synod pastor from Wisconsin. This was already a pretty close subject, but she is writing from Sheboygan County, which is my home county uh, in Wisconsin. So I haven't really done a lot of digging to see exactly which congregation she would have uh, been in. There were several older Lutheran congregations from at least the 1860s and perhaps earlier. Um, I think she may actually have been close to where my, my home congregation uh, was located, so perhaps there's even a, a personal connection there. But all that aside, there's some other interesting things beyond uh, just the geographic proximity to, to where I grew up. We also see in this letter a priority among German Lutherans 
for both a church and a school. And this is all within their first year of arrival. So we talked a lot last time about all the things these immigrants have to sort out. Being an immigrant anywhere at any time, you have a lot of things you got to figure out and get established in a new home. But being a pioneer immigrant on the on the frontier, more or less, is kind of a double whammy uh, because you have to deal with the lack of infrastructure of, of every kind. You have to worry about building your own homes and buildings and institutions and, and all that stuff. So the fact that they are building their own church and school uh, on top of everything else shows that it was a major priority for them. It's also interesting that as sometimes is the historical case and perhaps is oftentimes the overemphasized aspect in histories, uh, the church, the Lutheran church and school of these immigrants was not meant to be a vehicle or a vessel for simply preserving their native lands, language and culture. It's interesting that they insisted that English is the only language in that school. So the German language is, is, is not um, the cause for having their own church and their own school. In fact, English, at least for the school, is kind of the purpose of the school, at least for the children. Something else stood out to me was the very short temporary calls. Uh, and temporary calls still happen today, but it seems to be the normal case. Uh, a teacher for just a third of the year, a pastor for half of a year. And one wonders, is this just because of availability? Um, did they not have enough money? They, they they wouldn't know if they would still exist as a congregation a whole year from now. It seems, uh, based on the context from the previous letters we looked at last time, that there's probably a trial basis for these teachers and pastors. Um, you noted how Matilda said how they liked this pastor's first two sermons, but kind of implying we'll see how the rest of the sermons go throughout this, the rest of this period. You can also note that there's a multi-parish setup and there's a preaching rotation. He, this pastor, um, a Swabian from Schwaben, I guess in German, from the city of Ulm, uh, as she noted, his his background, his, his German geography and his origins, uh, this guy uh, who is unnamed in this letter, is only serving them on the, every third Sunday. So that implies that he's on a, a circuit. He's preaching at other uh, stations. This reflects the severe shortage of trained pastors that for many decades dominated the discussions among Lutherans on both sides of the Atlantic, beginning already in the late 1830s, um, really mid-1830s, and, and would go on for a long time. There's just a shortage of pastors. You're going to have to share pastors or be stretched thin uh, or maybe only have services once a month until a more permanent pastor could be found. So we also have a letter now from Sophie Frank to Matilda Frank, 1852, two years later. And she says this, tell our dear father, who is a pastor in Germany still, that he must come here. As all Germans in the whole county are saving their children to be baptized, Count Solms already has two to be baptized. His mother-in-law, who is very religious, finds it terrible that the children are not baptized, and he comforts her with the prospect of father's arrival. So, of course, we, there are interesting things about that we can comment on, too. Uh, why do they need a pastor if it's such an emergency? Uh, there's definitely some um, tradition, adiaphora, Christian freedom, uh, good order issues that would be discussed. I would suspect that uh, most even confessional Lutherans today would say if it's a uh, necessity, you don't even have a pastor, uh, yet that baptism would be something you want to do um, as head as a household, kind of an emergency thing. You don't need a pastor to make a baptism valid. Um, but there are a lot of other considerations going on there, so you see this need for pastors. We also have a letter now from John Kehrler to a friend in Germany, same year, 1852. He notes this, in my last letter, I wrote to you that Pastor Dulitz was to be our minister, but his trial sermon, which contained so much hatefulness toward people of other beliefs, caused general displeasure, and he was no longer wanted. Our congregation has now joined the Synod of Mühlhäuser, which has sent us an excellent preacher. Kester from Magdeburg, who alternately has early services on Kilburn Road every two weeks, so now our church affairs are in a desirable condition. 
So just a, a pause there. Uh, Veronica Kehler already had a letter we looked at last time where she noted the same thing that this Pastor Dulitz, which she kind of liked, honestly, as a pastor, said so many um, harsh things against the Reformed members within their own congregation, within their own community, that uh, turned people off from him. So here, uh, her father-in-law, John Kehler, is writing a little more, uh, or her father, I should say, John Kehler, is writing a little more uh, bluntly, saying it, this pastor is preaching outright hatefulness towards people of other beliefs, not uh, a caution against beliefs themselves. So if that's true, if that's a true situation, you can see why that caused, quote-unquote, general displeasure. But also very interesting to note that there are trial sermons uh, today, I, I would think most uh, confessional Lutherans would probably frown on the idea of, of trial sermons. It kind of works against the call systems that we have in place for the sake of decency and good order. But they weren't part of the synod yet. Uh, they were trying to see first which pastor would be a good shepherd for them and then associate with the, with the synod that the pastor was associated with. Now, Pastor Dulitz had been present at one of the early meetings of the Wisconsin Synod, but I think it was in 1851, but that same year he joined the Missouri Synod instead. So he's a Missouri Synod pastor. Uh, so John Carroller, one of the heads of the households, heads of families, and, and Greenfield is now with his congregation and his immediate family drawn to a slightly different direction, the Synod of Mielhäuser. And they get Pastor Kester, who comes up a couple times. His name is Conrad Kester. And uh, his I know a couple of Pastor Kesters in the Wisconsin Synod today. I have no idea if they're uh, descended from this guy, but that's interesting that that same name has passed, uh, has been passed on, perhaps, or at least comes up again. So I'll give you a brief context and information on the first German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Wisconsin, more easily called the Synod of Mühlhäuser. The first organizational meeting took place in late 1849 in Milwaukee. The Constitution was later adopted that next year in 1850 at Granville. So even though there were some preliminary meetings and agreements, everyone knew there was going to be a Wisconsin Synod, most likely already in 1849. It wasn't really made official until 1850, so that's why the 175th anniversary of the Synod will be celebrated in 2025, not 2024. Now, a lot of people have tried to analyze and uh, take make some conclusions about the Synod based on this Constitution at its founding. Uh, and they kind of focus on one general topic because that is the, the context of the day, at least in the decades after this. This was really the, the question about the Wisconsin Synod's identity, although there were other aspects to it, of course. But the Constitution did require subscription to the unaltered Augsburg Confession and, quote, the rest of the Evangelical Lutheran Church's confessions. It also stated that the fundamental doctrines of Holy Writ, Holy Scripture, the Bible, are essentially and correctly contained. Now, some people maybe look at that and see a somewhat qualified uh, subscription, maybe similar to the language used by the synods that are generally in the general synod, uh, I guess pun intended there, but uh, other people say, you know, that that maybe is looking at a little too strictly. There have been some quotes uh, from Mielhäuser that make it pretty clear. His number one priority, his top um, focus as a pastor, as a Lutheran, as a president of a synod, is not to be very clearly and very robustly confessional. He sees it as a positive. He doesn't really have a hatred or dislike for any teachings in the Lutheran confessions. He's basically saying, though, to put it in more modern terms, that's not what we're all about. Uh, we're not all about um, our confessional identity. And we see that now very similar to some of the attitudes of those members at the church in Greenville, if you go back to our last episode. So it really makes sense why these people joined Mühlhäuser Synod. Yes, we are confessional Lutherans in the sense that we subscribe to the Lutheran confessions. We want this, um, but that isn't going to be uh, what we lead with in every interaction with, with other people. Uh, they have a different approach to confessionalism and this has been talked about um, at large 
um, in most of the, the general histories of the Synod. This is really what gets a, a lot of attention, and it probably deserves to be looked at again, especially now in light of how this matches some of the attitudes of a lot of the laity in local congregations. Now, this early Wisconsin Synod made up was made up of only five pastors serving 18 congregations, and I'm not sure I should check the the notes again to see if that was 18 officially founded and organized congregations, or was that including preaching stations? Uh, maybe there were more preaching stations. I wouldn't be surprised if these were just the formal congregations that five pastors were serving, and they maybe were even visiting other locations as well. Uh, like I said, this is the frontier era, especially in Wisconsin, for settlement and immigration. Uh, communities, towns, cities, villages are literally popping up everywhere, um, sometimes overnight, uh, very quickly, and everything is just now beginning uh, for all kinds of aspects of life in this area. So things are going to grow and move very quickly, and rather than, uh, like the Senate is doing today, proactively uh, researching where there are growing population centers, trying to find, well, maybe we can find some core families to start a congregation. These guys are mostly reacting to, okay, there's a new group of Luther, German Lutheran immigrants just got off the boat, and they settled here, and another group is settling there, and we want to make sure that they are served uh, by pastors. Now, some comment about the name of the synod, uh, the first German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Wisconsin. Uh, today, it's just called the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. So we kept, uh, even today, 175 years later, almost, uh, the same identifiers, even uh, the name Wisconsin, even though there's been a merger of several old historic Midwest synods, uh, even though, uh, as we talked about in one of our more recent episodes, how the goal was to be in every state already uh, around 50 years ago. That was the, the stated goal. So why are we keeping the name Wisconsin? I think a lot of that is part of our historic identity. But we did drop two of the original uh, parts of the, the synod's name. That would be the first and the German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Wisconsin. Uh, the German part, maybe that's self-evident. Of course, it was um, primarily or almost exclusively German-speaking Lutherans serving other German-speaking Lutherans. And uh, as I pointed out, they had their hands full. There was more than enough ministry and, and mission opportunity there. Of course, that's going to change as immigration patterns uh, shift dramatically by the, the 1900s. It, it's, we're going to see a drop-off in German immigration, but of course the Americanization, the integration of several generations of these immigrants and also a focus on other groups of people will make that whole German thing both unpopular and unnecessary in, in many people's views and minds. But what about that other part, the first German Evangelical Lutheran Synod? Well, to put it uh, bluntly, uh, the Wisconsin Synod was not the first German Lutheran Synod to establish itself or have a presence in Wisconsin. The Missouri Synod already had some of the, the founding um, congregations in its 1847 organization were in Wisconsin. Uh, in fact, the oldest Wisconsin Lutheran Synod, and I mean the, the first uh, Lutheran congregation in Wisconsin was part of the Missouri Synod, already dating from the 1830s from their founding. Uh, also, the Buffalo Synod was officially including the name Wisconsin in its description. It's um, I can't think of the whole title off the top of my head, but the, the Synod of uh, the old Lutheran immigrants of, of Prussia located in New York and Wisconsin, or something to that effect, was their synod name. So uh, Wisconsin, I think, even at best, is at, at third place as being organized and establishing a distinct presence in the state of Wisconsin. So how did these people in our, the Frank Kaler letter collection view their synod? Well, we actually have an interesting and really the only example of a pastor-to-pastor -pastor letter in this collection. Pastor Conrad Kester, at the request of the, the Frank family members and the carolers living in southeastern Wisconsin, wrote a letter to the, the Frank patriarch, Pastor Frank, Pastor Frank, still living in Germany. He's saying 
uh, as as noted in the, those synod reports, we have many more congregations than we have pastors. And he says, I can find you just one little congregation that uh, you could serve in as you get close to uh, kind of retiring, you're an old age, kind of a uh, an easy situation for you. And I don't know, just thinking of all the, the struggles and the transitions, I don't know if any of these congregations was uh, super easy for anyone, but he's still uh, trying to get Pastor Frank to come over. And I don't think we'll talk about it later, but uh, let's, I'll just say it now. That Pastor Frank, although he wanted to come to America, probably more so just to be with his, his children and now new grandchildren that were being born, uh, he eventually did not end up going. Uh, he had a lot of uh, needs of his own local congregation he needed to serve, and his wife had ailing health. But this is what Pastor Kester wrote to Pastor Frank, and in this letter he describes the Wisconsin Synod. He says, Our Wisconsin Synod is an evangelical Lutheran one, not the so-called Old Lutheran. You must be acquainted with the quarrels of the various confessions, for the church newspapers are full of them. As I have been informed, you are definitely Lutheran, but not so exclusive. So, Pastor Kester here is both describing the Wisconsin Synod. We are evangelical. We are Lutheran, but not old Lutheran. And I think that's the, the attitude about uh, Lutheran identity and, and the rigidness that and maybe even um, conflict focused that it is. And that's what he's talking about. The newspapers are full of these conflicts and quarrels. It's very combative. Um, but he says to Pastor Frank, I informed you are definitely Lutheran, but not so exclusive. This probably um, is a nod to the, the unionism thing. So we are Lutheran, but we're willing to work with and maybe even include and, and worship with people of other denominations, other uh, confessions. So when Pastor Kester says our synod is an evangelical Lutheran one, the whole word evangelical is such a loaded term. It may mean several things. Uh, the original uh, term evangelical was sort of what the Protestants in Germany like to call themselves. We are evangelical. We are focused on the gospel. That's what the word really means. Of course, today, being an evangelical in America has its own specific identity. Yes, it's Christian, but it's a certain kind of Christian, uh, and you can expect certain things from it. And even today, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod is not trying to signal that, hey, we are just like the evangelicals in America, we're really trying to line up with them. And just back in the, in the day of the Synod's founding, the question is, were they using the word evangelical because of the gospel focus and the mission? I believe that's kind of the normal narrative I hear today. Or was it a subtle signal that we're Lutheran, but we are evangelical in a, in a general Protestant sense? And that's what uh, the official German term for the church union was. We aren't Lutheran. We aren't Reformed. We are Evangelish. We are Evangelical. So that's how the United Protestants would describe themselves as Evangelical. So that is kind of a, a riddle that I think some more history has to be done on. What exactly did this early church of the Wisconsin Synod mean by saying we are Evangelical Lutheran? These letters give us some clue, and this, this letter from Pastor Kester does that as well. You are definitely Lutheran, but not so exclusive. So he's contrasting himself with the old Lutherans in America and, and perhaps in Germany as well. We get another example of the confessionalism of the Frank Kaler family. We see it in the marriage between August Frank, August Frank, and Veronica Kaler in 1852. So they had a prenuptial agreement. So before they got married, they signed kind of a contract, an agreement. And whenever you say prenup today, the only thing I think of, and maybe that's what most of you think of, is the fact that they're willing to have an agreement on how to split their finances or how to proceed if and when they decide to call off the marriage and get divorced, which is uh, something Christians don't do, or at least it's not a Christian thing to do to plan for uh, breaking off a marriage that is supposed to be forever. So that's not what's going on here. The marriage agreement, Article 1, says this. The two engaged ones promise each other conjugal love and faithfulness, and, if God should bless them with children, to have them instructed and raised in the Evangelical Lutheran religion, Augsburg Confession. End quote. 
man, I'm almost uh, jealous of that pre-marriage agreement. I don't know if we do that anymore, if anyone really does that, but at least it's a conversation that, uh, of course, Lutherans and any Christian really needs to have with their future spouse. Uh, Kids are probably uh, likely going to happen for most married couples. Uh, At least it's something to consider uh, having children. What are you going to do? if and when, if God should bless you, as they stated, with children. Um, obviously, the, the primary responsibility of parents to their children is to raise them up, right? Not just f- taking care of their physical needs, but their spiritual needs as well. And they address that. Uh, we will raise them and have them instructed. They need to be taught in our Christian faith, specifically evangelical Lutheranism, Augsburg Confession. So very confessional, a uh, very explicit and uh, yeah, maybe we should think about having these conversations in such a way some more. But that's me just making this about the present, but I was just impressed by that. But overall, it shows they were very confessional, I think is the main point. So August Frank wrote to his parents, he said, I've delivered father's letter to my father-in-law, so Pastor Frank in Germany to John Keller Sr., and have the friendliest greetings and compliments to send you. He is an extremely honest and upright man. In religion, he is zealously devoted to strictly orthodox Lutheranism. Our dear father, if he were here, would surely agree and converse with him easily, since he has much knowledge and is a very educated man. Okay, so these two letters, written from almost exactly the same time as that description of of leaving uh, behind the old Lutheran pastor, Dulitz, who joined the Missouri Synod and gravitating and now joining Mulehoiser's Synod, and then one of the, the pastors, Kester, describing the Wisconsin Synod, uh, we see that uh, maybe things aren't as as they've been so easily oversimplified by in, in Wisconsin Synod church histories. Um, the common narrative, I would say it's pretty much a myth at this point that I hear repeated by by people who have a, a general idea of, of Wisconsin Synod history but haven't really read the sources. They say, well, Wisconsin Synod used to be unconfessional or they weren't really confessional. They didn't care about the confessions. And then it's the old Lutherans like Walther came in to, to save the day. Um, we'll talk about that more, hopefully, if I get Pastor Prangy on for the second part of his his two volumes on, on church fellowship. Uh, that's clearly not the case. These people are describing themselves and describing each other to others as being confessional Lutherans. So it's it's a little more complicated is what I'm trying to get at here. Strictly Orthodox Lutheran Church is the way August Frank described um, his father-in-law to his own father, saying, and you would get along with him. So being definitely Lutheran, but not so exclusive, I think we're having a discussion about doctrine and, and practice. So the old Lutherans and these evangelical Lutherans in the Wisconsin Synod, I would say for the most part, are agreeing on the doctrine, but it's the practice of having your uh, interactions with other Christians, the whole fellowship aspect, the unionism aspect, that's where they're really disagreeing. How do you go about um, being a confessional, an orthodox, an Augsburg confession kind of Lutheran? So that's something that uh, Peter Prangy uh, really takes up with his book. So having come to a a better understanding of the position, the mindset of the Wisconsin Synod is varied and it may be conflicting and uh, inconsistent as it maybe appears at at times. That's where they're coming from, at least uh, both in public documents and now private letters, just telling people how they see it, describing their faith and their religion and the religion of their, their fellow people. So very valuable insights. We'll move away from that and now just describe what we get from these letters, the, the pastor's role in these early years in the Wisconsin Synod. And this is primarily good, now going to be the perspective of the lay people. How did they see their pastors? What did they see that they needed or wanted from their pastors? And, and how do they interact with them? We get an example now from part of the, the Michigan group. Uh, Pastor Frank in Germany is writing to his son-in-law and daughter, William and Sophie. He says, God has watched over you and has given you and your daughter life and health, and has given grace that your Matilda be baptized. It is quite touching that your little one is among the little Indians in the baptismal book in Bethany. And through the heathens, this great truth has come true, that we are all brothers and sisters. End quote. So it turns out that the Bethany mission, uh, which had been 
somewhat uh, the brainchild of Wilhelm Lea. Um, I'm a little fuzzy on all the details on, on that connection, but uh, some of the old uh, German Lutheran colonies, immigrants had been f- sent to Michigan and they, they settled in that General Saginaw area. Uh, Frankenmuth is, is probably the most famous of those settlements, but there are many others in the general area. So there was a mission to the, the Chippewa, as they were called, or the Ojibwe Native Americans, and, and now the missionary to those people is also serving the local uh, German immigrants who didn't immigrate as part of those confessional Lutheran colonies. He's also serving the the broader population. Uh, So very interesting to see that connection with other aspects of Lutheran history. Uh, In 1855, this is Pastor E.G.H. Meisler. He came down again from the mission to baptize another daughter, uh, Marie. So this is something that was going on for several years. Now we get a description of a wedding. How did the the people here see and interact with their pastor for a a wedding? Henry Frank is writing to uh, Matilda Frank in 1853. He wrote, quote, We drove in sunshine to the church two miles away to Greenfield at 10 o'clock. The first wagon where August, who was driving, and Veronica, my bride, and I. Pastor Kester, Father, Matilda, Edward, and Herman were in the second. We took Veronica's accordion which she plays well from the wagon, and carried it into the church to accompany the singing. The pastor had a nice marriage sermon whose text we had chosen, Psalm 124, verse 8. So, real quick note here, he says accordion, but the translators, the transcribers, um, the editors, uh, someone noted that they actually have Veronica's quote-unquote accordion, but it's actually not an accordion. It's called a fis harmonica, which is really a portable reed organ. So uh, they had a portable reed organ that one of the lay members, Veronica, who comes up quite a bit in these letters, had. And she kept it at her home, though, and then they brought it to church uh, to play. So the house organ is brought into church for at least this wedding service. I don't know if what was used for a regular Sunday morning service but at least for this wedding. So I just thought that was kind of fascinating. Uh, how many of you pack up your organ in the back seat of your minivan and take it to church to play? Um, I'm sure some of our mission congregations maybe have uh, musicians or, or others. I'm sure if you have different instruments other than the organ, at least, uh, that you're packing up and taking with you. But um, very different situation. But here we see the role of the pastor, um, of course, taking part in marriages. It was uh, an essential part of, of life to have a pastor around to have marriage. We also see a description of the pastor's role at a funeral. John Kaler wrote to the parents of deceased man. I think it was a man who was working um, at his farm. This was back a little bit earlier in the timeline before they had Pastor Kester. It was still Pastor uh, Dulitz. He wrote, quote, the minister of our church was away, so I went to another city and asked a minister named Dulitz to deliver the funeral sermon. The whole neighborhood attended and was astonished at the nice service at the grave. Four verses of the hymn, Jesus, My Sure Defense, were sung. The address at the grave was so gripping that most likely no one at the cemetery left untouched. We'll note that this is a comfort of the time that a good death, quote-unquote, a good death was an essential part of antebellum society. It was just part of the culture where you wanted to assure everyone that if their loved one died while they were away, that they had a a good death, a good funeral. Their last moments here on earth were were a peaceful ushering into uh, the new life. Uh, The death process, uh, as painful as it may be, as often as it happened, of course, uh, in people's lives, was kind of a, a moment to remark upon. So kind of the opposite of today, where we really hide death. Even uh, funerals are more about a celebration of life than addressing death itself. Um, cremation, um, in a way, you know, is a, the opposite of having that open casket funeral. I know it's just not as expensive, and that's the reason why a lot of people do that. But in the past, uh, you had visitations, you had wakes, you had people to see the body and, and really grieve and get that mourning process out there. And we see this still being part of the culture. I, I don't think it really mattered too much whether you were an English-speaking Yankee or a German immigrant. Um, death in in the mid-1800s just was a slightly different process with, with the funeral. Now we get a letter from Henry Frank to his parents. 
living in Germany from 1855. He gives another description. Uh, this one's probably um, the most moving section I personally read. Saturday, February 10th. After giving a fatherly kiss to the little one, little Henry August Frank, I left in the best mood to get Pastor Kester for the baptism. I returned at him at five in the evening, happy to be able to fondle my little one. But instead of a healthy child, about to be baptized, I found a sick, dying one. It all started in the afternoon, and God took him that night around 10.15 a.m. Around 8 o'clock, Pastor Kester advised us to have him baptized, and he was not alone with holy water, but with the tears of all who stood around. I sent Andreas into the city to announce the death on Monday. My man, my worker, met August just as he with Veronica, Herman, and the children were about to get the sled to come for the baptism. You can imagine their shock. We submit to the will of the one who knows what is best for us. Farewell. Uh, I just see this as a, personally, as a, as a father, very moving uh, moment, and how fortunate it was that they were in the habit of uh, doing home baptisms. Hey, a pastor, come over. Let's have a baptism. This is a wonderful thing for us to do. Um, let's do it as soon as possible. And yet he came just hours before that the child passed away. But what a comfort that they had um, in that baptism for, for their child. So we see here the the tradition of having, well, and it's still, of course, the way it's done today, have the pastor do the baptism, but interestingly, uh, do it in the home. And we see this as a pattern where I would say the more standard, the more traditional a form of baptism is to have it take place as part of the public worship service. Uh, of course, it still happens other ways today. We also see the pastor's role in these letters as a spiritual shepherd and advisor. Pastor Kester had noted his connection with the elder Frank sons in Wisconsin, and he concurs with their desire to have their father come and immigrate to Wisconsin to serve as a pastor among them. He says it this way. I already mentioned this a little bit, but he, he describes the need for pastors in general. Uh, Pastor Kester writes, There's still a shortage of good shepherds and spiritual advisors. There are enough hirelings. You could serve the congregation in Greenfield with word and sacrament. It is a congregation of 30 families and a neat little church. I have enough to do and would turn this congregation over to you, a shepherd who has become gray in the service of the Lord, to lead in the pastures of life. It would not be a burden to you. I would give you only joy. So that's the description of the pastor's role. Now we get to see just through observation as the letter writers describe their life in the church, their religious activity. We also get a fair picture of the laity's role. So earlier uh, in the timeline here, we see John Kaler Sr. write already in 1850. He describes his church activity uh, to a friend. He writes, our church life is also taken care of. Formerly, we drove to the city for church, but this summer an evangelical church, Augsburg Confession, is to be built here, a half hour away. I have participated in this, so that our wishes in that direction will also be fulfilled. Henry Frank wrote to his parents a few years later, quote, Regarding church, we have founded a small evangelical congregation, Father Carler being the president of the board. Everyone helped sacrifice to have a minister who lives 10 miles from here and comes every two weeks to preach. The congregation pays him only $60 a year, but will raise his salary later. The distance is a little hard for our pastor, Kester, and he would like to have a substitute. We thought of our dear father, but without trying to persuade you to take steps to obtain this position, if you come to us, we will do all we can to make your life as pleasant as possible. So back in 2021, when I first made this presentation, I looked up what $60 a year was. Of course, inflation has gone up in the last two years, but still, just the purchasing power, how much um, could you buy today with $60, came out two years ago to $3,415. Uh, so $3,500 a year a year as a salary is a little low. But of course, notice he's coming just every two weeks, so there's another uh, congregation that is likely supporting him. Uh, but I hope they're also not paying him just uh, a $60 because that's a pretty uh, modest salary. Now we have a letter from August Frank in Milwaukee, who is at Grace Downtown, as it's called today. He's describing uh, how they interact with his congregation. 
He wrote, quote, Pastor Mielhoiser received $2 worth of sugar and coffee from us for a New Year's present, and the schoolmaster $2. The church pew for my family costs $6.25 this year, and the unexpected collections and contributions amount to $10 a year. So about $20 a year goes for the church. Yes, one mind's changes tremendously, for in Germany I would not have given so much for this purpose. But as a father of a family, I realize that the church cannot exist without support, and that the state cannot exist without religion. End quote. So we see, uh, now this is kind of five years, well really four years into the immigration, and August Frank is noticing there's a tremendous change of mind. Uh, it was unthinkable to pay nearly anything. Uh, for church at all. You're not really paying for it. You might just give a, a donation for maybe someone in need, or maybe you would collect a mission offering for uh, some special mission that your church uh, is doing out of the ordinary, but uh, so to support the church. Now, it's interesting that they are charging uh, a pew price, but I guess that's the idea of finding a way to, to regulate it or standardize the cost of the church is, well, just picture it as you're paying for your seat. Uh, maybe that's how people are able to wrap their minds around uh, their presence there. But uh, giving quite a bit to the church each year in Milwaukee, $20 a year in 1854 is equivalent to about $626 in 2021. So again, uh, the purchasing power, I don't know what that would do uh, today with inflation, um, but it's about $600 and, and so dollars. So he's giving his offering is about $600 a year, depending on how. Now in 1857, almost a decade after immigration, Henry Frank is still writing to his family members about church, obviously still an important thing to everyone involved, and he goes into some detail. He writes, Now a bit about our church conditions, about which you, dear father, have asked me several times. Our congregation consists of 50 families who pay as much as they are able. The minimum is $2. Father Kehler pays the maximum, $12, and I eight. I give about $20 a year to the church in collections and Christmas present for the minister. Regina gave $25 on our wedding day. The annual income for the church amounts to $150 a year, of which Pastor Kester, who preaches every two weeks, gets 70 Other fees are voluntary. It is truly poor pay for a minister. The church is evangelical Protestant, although Reformed, Lutheran, and offshoots are all part of the congregation. Quarrels result, ending with one or the other leaving. We had long disputes because of the wafers and the bread. Every three years, five members are elected elders, who among themselves elect a president, secretary, and treasurer. Father Kaler has been present, president since 1854, and I treasurer. We have decided to buy two acres to build a parsonage. Father signed up for $200, and I for 50 which the congregation will pay back at 7%. Mr. Kester, the pastor, made the modest request of $200 a year, and it is a wonder how we can live on that. I subscribe to two secular and one Christian newspaper, the New York Staatszeitung, the Gradaus, and the Milwaukee, Week, the Milwaukee Weekly, and the Lutertia Herald from New York. So just a note here, uh, if Frank's accounting is correct, then it is clear that the Frank family and the Kalers gave significantly more to the congregation than the average family. So that, that's just a note for um, the historian who's looking at this, that this is the above average family, so maybe they're talking about religion a bit more because they uh, care about it a bit more. Maybe they just have um, a more profitable business and they're able to afford more. Um, that would take a little more analyzing to see that. So this letter obviously shows, again, the confessional issues. Uh, you say you're Lutheran, uh, but this letter actually says we are evangelical Protestant, which is really saying we are you know, a union congregation, not a Lutheran congregation. So you get different people, even in the same family unit, the same family group, describing their own congregation in different ways. And it's no doubt, as this letter describes, there are quarrels and squabbles over a lot of important things. It turns out you can't really have it both ways. You can't say we are definitely Lutheran, but not so exclusive. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to put your doctrine into practice in some ways that maybe uh, cause making a little firmer 
uh, stand on some issues, especially as seen in this letter, the evidence is that a lot of the discussions and disagreements, the heated disagreements, were over communion, which, as we said in the last episode, this was the main tension point, one of the main conflict points between the Reformed and Lutherans for centuries, and this is the issue that the old Lutherans had with the Union Church, the merger of Reformed and Lutheran into one organization in many of the countries that make up modern-day Germany, and these issues came across the Atlantic. Uh, It turns out getting along with your neighbor, who you may rely on in these frontier conditions in America, maybe would induce some people to make some religious compromises, but uh, they're going to have to figure out what they're doing. And we'll see later uh, throughout the history of the Wisconsin Synod, these people realized, okay, if we are definitely Lutheran, a doctrine and practice are going to have to be a little more uniform in this regard. So they did become more Lutheran, obviously, over time, um, but it's more of the problems caused the reaction rather than starting off with a certain definition. Okay, switching gears here, we have another letter from Henry Frank, 1862, written a little over a year after immigration had already begun. He wrote, quote, Edward and his wife brought the minister after church. After the meal, the table was converted into an altar, and the children were baptized. The pastor didn't give a baptism sermon, but baptized according to the order of service, as you did in Kerenbach. It was cute when little Emily, Ernst's daughter, only 16 months old, answered the usual questions with a very loud yes. Ernst was so very happy about the child prodigy that he positively smirked. Pastor Johannes Kilian remained with our lively group for several hours. He can be quite cheerful and is not straight-laced, as so many pastors are. End quote. So just a note here, the typical Lutheran liturgy for baptism would ask the parents, the sponsors, and the congregation if they promised to raise the child in the word of God and, and to see the child's spiritual welfare. Um, other liturgies even have a, a renouncing of the devil, um, and the parents would do that on behalf of, of the child um, at a child baptism. So those are the questions that uh, the little child is also participating in as a, as a younger member of, of the Christian family there. And now we see, very briefly mentioned, there's another pastor on the scene. had Pastor Milhoiser, uh, Pastor Kester, and now it looks like they did get their own pastor, Pastor Kilian. Uh, he's uh, interesting of note. Uh, he would later serve as the chaplain of the 26th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment in the Civil War. As far as I know, he would be the only uh, Wisconsin Synod pastor to serve as uh, a chaplain in a Civil War regiment. So that might be a topic I'll dig into later because that sounds rather interesting, but he just pops up here and happens to be a a more friendly pastor than a straight-laced pastor. Kind of interesting how people still describe their pastors in in these kinds of terms today. So now uh, we will wrap up our presentation uh, with some examples of people who didn't quite fit the mold of uh, being Lutheran in any way or or trying to uh, create uh, Lutheran structures or have a Christian establishment in the frontier as they try to, quote-unquote, civilize their new environments. And then we'll conclude with some uh, conclusions and and final observations. We have a letter from John Kaler, Jr. to his sister from 1851. So John Kaler, Sr. is very zealous, as his son-in-law described him. Uh, to to his father-in-law. He's, uh, he's an Orthodox Lutheran. He cares about this very much. Uh, he is providing for the needs of the congregation. He's the, the congregation president in Greenfield. He was giving a lot in donations. He was involved in calling pastors, um, even when they didn't have a congregation, but just to do funerals and such. So very religious, very active. And we see most of his children uh, follow their father's example. Except for John Jr., Uh, He wrote a letter to his sister that it's one of the longest letters in the collection, and it's just a rambling uh, letter of a young man. Uh, It's full of profanity, making excuses for himself, justifying himself. Uh, He's isolating himself. He's just full of unforgiveness for um, he doesn't really respect his father's direction or correction or discipline, trying to get him uh, to act at where conduct himself in a certain way. It just comes across to me as being a rather self-centered young man, um, really whining to his sister. Uh, He had a falling out with his father 
And he wrote, his inconsiderate reproaches hurt me to the extent that I became enraged and made an extreme decision. So this guy is uh, really not part of the family. He's not actively engaging or communicating with them. He's kind of writing this letter to his sister to explain why she's not going to see him around anymore, um, or he's not really going to interact with his family. Uh, I just took a, one quote, it's still pretty long, but one quote from his rambling letter and this man's struggling with his religious identity, uh, and America is, and the immigration process is helping him process it, or at least it's causing him to rethink everything. He says this, Take away a man's freedom, his convictions and leanings, and say that his doings are fantasies, and his convictions, rationalism, and he will remain unhappy, no matter what his circumstances. Can it be counted as an error for me that I still have young blood, and that I like to live in ideas, that I hate the formality of religion and the foolish priesthood, that I, at the age of 28, would rather think and do what suits me best? I will let reason speak first in all things, and then experience. Feelings and hereditary customs never decided my actions in Germany, and will not do so in this free country, where not much sociability and pleasure are found, but where just this freedom makes one forget everything else. So he's having a certain reaction to this freedom, and he's basically saying, uh, I'm going to do whatever I want, and you can't stop me. He adds this, My final aim is only this, to become wealthy, in order to make more easily my life and the life of others happy. My reason knows only the cold side of life, and my actions are evidently patterned after that. My principles will never suffer under it, and in this I try to be a Christian. Formality, disputes, and priestly glory, since I have seen and read so much about them, are things which are useless, something with which the masses are dazzled for the advantage of a few honor-seeking individuals. Leave our earthly hull and this little earth and what remains of all the talk, these quarrels, and petty things. So, he complains about hypocrisy among Christians, as has always been and always will be, unfortunately, and the pietist formality that he observes. So he has a different uh, take on the old Lutherans, but similar. He doesn't like them. He doesn't like pietism, but more because it infringes on his personal freedom, uh, rather for the, the general discord among the, the religious community. So in a way, he's somewhat like his, his father, but for very different reasons in his regard for uh, pietist old Lutherans. John Kaler does continue to write, quote, I have nothing against a suitable church service. I hate the dumb people who are free thinkers as much as many are in Milwaukee. They believe nothing, not because of conviction, but because of aping. End quote. So, uh, kind of an odd way to reassure your sister that he hasn't totally got off the deep end. He hates other people, too, who aren't religious. Uh, kind of a negative way to try to prop himself up. I I really don't uh, understand exactly where he's coming from. At least I can't empathize with it. But uh, we do see that uh, just because you're a German uh, Lutheran on paper in Germany and you came to America, you certainly didn't automatically uh, join the church, even if the rest of your family became active and engaged members. Uh, we see this um, reflected in the Lutheran understanding of the difference between the visible church and the invisible church. Uh, this guy maybe was part of a visible church before, but um, he doesn't really want to be part of it. So he is really being harsh and critical. It sounds like he wants to try to be a Christian, but only after uh, his reason has led him to believe what he wants to believe, after he has the freedom to do whatever he wants to do. And his chief aim, he says, is to make a lot of money. And that's how he thinks he'll be a good Christian, because then with all of his money, he can make himself and perhaps some other people happy as well. So uh, nothing new under the sun. This attitude existed long before America offered its uh, version of freedom, and it still, of course, continues be around today. So now we have a letter from Augusta Frank. Uh, so she's the matriarch of the Frank family. Her husband is the pastor still in Germany and she's still uh, staying with him by his side. So she's concerned about her relatives in Michigan. The Wisconsin family relatives by and large are very active in their churches. They're organizing churches and, and all of that. But the Michigan Frank families they had the missionary come over and baptize their children, um, 
But other than that, we don't really see as much activity in religious life um, or being part of a congregation, uh, regular worship, and so on. So Augusta Frank is writing to her daughters and her um, son-in-laws and, and her grandchildren. She's writing out of concern. She writes, quote, If you will write once that you have been in this or that church, but never a word, I hope you have not forgotten how to pray. We like to hear that Edward and August shoot so many deer, and that Henry cooks such good coffee and feeds pigs and chickens. But we would also like to know which church you attend. You must not be offended. It is meant well. So we have Edward Bark is the son-in-law, one of the son-in-laws who lives in Saginaw. He's writing to other German relatives in 1860. His letters are, as uh, his mother-in-law's letter indicated, is primarily focused on agriculture on hunting, and he's really interested in local and national politics. His letters are often critical of his old Lutheran neighbors, but he is, uh, gives evidence he's connected with some kind of church, but he gets more into detail about the politics. He's active in politics. He is part of the Freemasons, which uh, would indicate he's not uh, going to be part of an old Lutheran congregation anytime soon, and he's a member of the German-American Association. And he wrote this. And he, he uses dated language, just I probably should have said that earlier. Um, I'm just reading his direct quote here. He says, The number of converted redskins cannot increase because most of them have left the area. When I think of how money is squeezed out of the people in Germany for missions and see how it is wasted here, I become more embittered against them than I was. I do not know to what organization the mission belongs, but I'm firmly convinced that they are throwing their money away. Mr. Meisler, the missionary, is a dear man, but he cannot change anything. There's also no lack of American missionaries who accomplish more than the Germans one do. The Indians prefer the company of the French, which undoubtedly has its historical basis, end quote. So I'll fill in the historical um, spots here that uh, Edward Bark wasn't able to fill. So this was the uh, kind of the Leia missionary colonies and their, their their Indian mission that got started in the, the 1840s, but by now this is now officially part of what is today the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So this is a Missouri Synod missionary, a Missouri Synod mission. Um, interestingly enough, I had um, ancestors on one side of my family who are part of this, um, both the Franken uh, Muth immigration and uh, the, the mission work. One of them was a, a missionary. So he's kind of uh, bad-mouthing uh, my family here, but I won't take it personally. Uh, he, he says he's upset because they're wasting money of the poor peasants in Germany, how they're collecting mission offerings and how it's being wasted here. And that just makes him embittered against uh, this kind of religion. Um, his idea of waste isn't that the missionaries or the missions are embezzling funds or throwing money away uh, and squandering it. He's just saying it's pointless because German missionaries are never going to be successful with uh, Native Americans here. Um, and he did have a, a point it's, it's in some degree that uh, the mission did have to close down in Michigan, but that's because these Native Americans uh, removed to upstate Minnesota, uh, but the Missouri Senate followed them there and continued the mission work. And uh, it was kind of shut down when some of the, the Indian wars burned down uh, the mission there. So, yeah, there there were definitely some challenges as far as this kind of, of mission work was concerned. But that is a whole other topic. But we do get his uh, civilian lay um, perspective on it. Uh, he writes a little bit more about this mission. Quote, the Bethany Mission Station has been moved to Chippewa River. Missionary Meisler comes to Saginaw several times a year and baptizes six children at one time at Rosers this winter. The mission cannot and will not have great results. The old Lutheran congregations are still in existence, and there are such ministers in Saginaw, Frankenluce, Frankenmuth, Trost, Hilfa, these four colonies organized by uh, Wilhelm Leah. He continues, they still carry on their old foolishness, such as confession, acts of penance, etc., these congregations will become quite weak in another generation. Of this, there are signs already. So while Bark is correct about the old Lutheran's Ojibwe mission, uh, he made some incorrect claims about their beliefs and practices. Indeed, the old Lutheran heritage still remains a major feature in these communities and um, through some of the, the lines you can trace through the Missouri Synod today. So J.P. Kaler, as I mentioned in our last episode, noted the importance of this letter 
collection. He said, these letters tell us some things that would otherwise remain unknown. Well, what things does this letter collection show us that we could not find in any other primary source material, and therefore it's not reflected in any other history that doesn't deal with with the source material? Well, we see a lot of uh, honest and private opinions about decisions and, and policies, such as how much to pay a pastor, how to decide whether to call a pastor, whether based on a sermon that he had preached or some other quality about him. We see lay opinions on their thoughts of the physical beauty of church buildings, especially if they liked the, the big cities in New York or Chicago when these people passed through. They were just impressed by the architecture. We also see the lay person's perception of the pastoral office. We have descriptions of preaching, baptizing, conducting uh, funerals, and performing marriages. We see mentions of church schools, but interestingly enough, not specifically catechism. I guess the closest uh, I've got to today was a prenuptial agreement saying our children will be raised in the instruction of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. So that would, of course, include catechism, but the process itself is not described in this letter collection. These letters also give us a glimpse and a real good understanding at times of congregational life. We see in Greenfield, there were minimum and maximum annual offering requirements. We see examples of Grace Downtown having people pay for church pews. I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, we also see repeated frequent examples of private home baptisms. That seemed to be the normal procedure. And we also get some insights that wouldn't be recorded in the, in the minutes or synodical reports of the intimate relationships with pastors, examples of having pastor over for coffee and talking about how cheerful he was. And we see the customs of giving gifts to the pastors and the teachers as well, sugar, coffee, and, and so on. And we also get the lay perspectives on unionism, old Lutheranism, and so on, all this other stuff that would likely not be very prominent in our understanding of this history. So in this letter collection, we see initially how in the Wisconsin Synod, communities of Lutherans or quote-unquote evangelicals, even mixed Reformed and, and German Lutheran immigrants, formed congregations focused primarily on a practical geographic area. We also see that rather than joining synods based on their doctrinal positions, congregations often first focused on the individual pastor and then joined the pastor's affiliated synod. As we see in Henry Frank's letter to his parents from 1857, the laity were the ones who wrestled themselves with the issues of doctrine and practice in their congregations. Ultimately, they had the freedom and the responsibility to take clearer theological stances as congregations. In other words, if every person took their pastor's position on a theology or a practice, there would have been no quarrels, right? If he just said, this is what we're going to do, they all would have said, yes, pastor, and done it. But that doesn't happen. At the same time, though, if these congregations didn't agree with the positions of the pastor or of a synod, they would find one that they could agree with. So um, it was a mutual understanding, more or less, uh, between the congregation, the pastor, and the synod. They were generally at the same place, on the same page, or at least working within the same space where they can patiently uh, go in the same direction. So in the Wisconsin Synod, we see both pastors and congregations moving in a more confessional direction during the 1850s while still maintaining a distaste for the quote-unquote old Lutheranism. Now to step back into this world of the Franks and Kalers would make many modern uh, Lutherans look at some of these differences. Some of these aspects would come from simply being in a different culture, at a different time, at a different place. But these differences are not just external or superficial. Just imagine uh, being part of the Wisconsin Synod back in those days uh, where you had to deal with these issues of being an evangelical Protestant, dealing with other denominations, being part of your membership. Uh, there's a lot for us to consider from this. So even if it seems like there's not that much in common 175 years later that uh, modern-day uh, Lutherans have with these people, uh, realize that you actually have a lot more in common with them. These are fellow human beings, fellow Lutherans, fellow redeemed children of God, served by the means of grace. Uh, we can walk with them and, and through them, through their words, through their letters, as they experienced uh, births, baptisms, confirmations, weddings, and, and funerals. We can relate to the joy they had at the wedding and uh, be touched 
by the emotions expressed at the, the pain and the heartbreak of losing a child, while at the same time holding on to the quiet baptismal hope and trust in the will of God. Uh, these are not the hyper-stereotyped version of Germans without emotion. Uh, the emotion is there. It's maybe revealed a bit more in the private letters than, than publicly, uh, but it's there, and, and so are the, the questions of faith. So this is where I'll, I'll kind of stop, though, making any modern connections. I'll leave that for others to to learn and to teach lessons. I would rather just stick to the history side at this point, uh, although I did, of course, uh, opinionate a little bit uh, throughout this episode and, and probably the last one, too. Kind of hard not to because it, it is... Uh, it is real life. It is uh, history, but it's 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 real faith being uh, interacted with here. So, if you have any questions or comments about this uh, project, uh, want to look at the source material, uh, reach out to me. Of course, you can find us on our social media or support us on Patreon. <laughs>